Hello, and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode sponsored by the Brain Learning Institute. The field of education is a largely untapped resource begging to be milked year after year for profit. Currently, only textbooks are able to run rampant in the sector with massive profit margins that can be kept high by releasing new editions or locking the actual use of the book, for example, submitting problem sets, behind DRMs and paywalls. While education is slow to change and adapt on a large scale, so do neuroscience education evangelists are trying to find ways into education through gimmicky technologies and promises. At the Brain Learning Institute, we work to inoculate educators and administrators from neuroscience snake oil salesmen by debunking neuroed myths. No more 10% myth, no more left bright, left or right brain learners, and no more learning style differences. By making an investment early, you can avoid the pain of buying into a false neuroeducational practice and product. Somewhere around 20% of the U.S. population is bilingual, and that number is steadily increasing. Besides being able to speak more than one language, years of research has indicated that bilingualism has a number of other advantages, from understanding and appreciating cultural references, to opening up new job opportunities, and even being able to express yourself in a number of different forms or personalities. Language and thought are so closely intertwined, it raises the question of how the brains of monolingual speakers and bilingual speakers are different. Today, I speak with Chantal Tavares about bilingualism, the brain, and both the advantages and the generally unrecognized disadvantages of bilingualism. All right, well, thank you for coming in. I'm with Chantal Tavares. Pretty close. <laughs> I think it's just a part of the podcast. I get everyone's name wrong, uh, but we're talking about bilingualism. Maybe if I had a different language ability, I would have been able to say it correctly. Maybe. Uh, so what got you interested in bilingualism? Um, well, I think in general, I'm taking cultural psychology class. Oh, yeah. um, so I guess like the idea is like I had this general idea that I wanted to like look at neuroscience and culture, but I guess that topic was a little bit too broad um, to go into. So I was like, I needed to find something that I was interested, but also, like, I don't know, that would be relevant to other people. So, I guess, like, going to my own personal experiences, I do know two languages. So, I grew up in a very diverse community. Like, in my building alone, there's probably, like, ten people with ten different dialects of Spanish and then, like, ten other languages that, like, I don't know, I could differentiate, but, like, I obviously didn't know what they were saying. So, I guess that, like, one experience comes from that. But my mom also takes care of children, so... Mm -hmm. My mom speaks Spanish and English, and some of the children do enter with Spanish, like, Latino backgrounds, Mm -hmm. Um, but some of them aren't at all, yet they learn the language, which is really, I think, like, the development is so nice, like, their parents may not speak it, but, like, when they come to my house, it's like, hola, como esta, and, like, they can have, like, a short conversation, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of schools making the movement towards having two languages. Uh, I know when I went to grad school in Iowa, there was a community like 10 miles away uh, that was uh, uh, interestingly in a a state that's 97 percent caucasian Mm -hmm. uh, there's a large uh, percentage of immigrants from latin american countries and uh, so the school was um, like half day uh, in spanish half day in english or full day spanish and then the next day was all english and um, by the time everyone graduated they were fluent in both spanish and and english Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Well, I know of a school like that. Um, I used to babysit um, this boy named Hendrix. Such a nice name, right? Yeah. Um, and he like he he didn't he knew a lot of Spanish. Mm-hmm. I mean, he would always talk to his grandma. Um, but like the school, um, I don't know what it was exactly, but it was just like a laid back school where they they just did a bunch of projects. They had ducks. I remember at one point where they like actually took it home. Which oh. Wow. I was like so surprised. I was like, what are you doing with these ducks? You can't just steal these ducks. He was like, no, 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 it's my turn. Oh yeah. <laughs> But um, related to language, just I, I think it's so impressive that like children can learn it so quickly, mm-hmm. um, and just their development in it. I don't know. I guess like one thing that I'm going to go into is probably like children development yeah. in the future. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Just I grew up with children, so I'm like, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, the way that science talks about it. It's like one area where they kind of describe it as almost magical. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. it's universal grammar that we have like these special brains that are just meant to pick up language, uh, and I always find it kind of odd that we jump to magic just because it, it is so impressive yeah 
Uh, but what are, what are some interesting findings you found in your research so far? Um, I guess a lot of it has to do with, like, I don't know, the advantages of bilingualism that, like, most people do know, but then there's also the, like, disadvantages that most people tend to ignore as yeah. well. So I guess that's, like, one thing that I was, um, I don't know, as, like, a bilingual person, I was like, okay, speaking two languages is great because I can, like, go into jobs, I can do this, like, I just have, you know, a bunch of advantages that mm-hmm. are also included in it. Um, but there's also that, like, higher cognitive load that's involved, like, trying to restrain yourself, like, constantly having to, like, put down one language if you're talking in another language or thinking in one language and speaking in another one, which yeah. I find myself constantly doing. I'm like, I'll speak in Spanish, and I'm like, oops, okay, wrong context. Right. And, like, sometimes there's just words that, like, you can have in one language that's just, like, you can't speak in another one. I don't know. I just find myself in, like, these moments, like, okay, this is really interesting. And I wish I found more information about it, but because it's so intangible, mm-hmm. it's so hard to find. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my other class later today, we're talking about... Um, linguistic relativity, uh, the thought that our language shapes how we think about things. And so I was looking at uh, a website that showed, uh, now I'm not going to find it, uh, but like the different, uh, these different words from languages that just like have, are untranslatable, Mm -hmm. uh, and they just like perfectly sum up this kind of like large uh, feeling about different things. Uh, And I think that's a perfect example of where language is uh, kind of shaped by how we grow up. I feel like that too, like just like even personality... Um, I don't know, in my family itself, like, you you give off a different essence or person Mm -hmm. when you speak in one language as opposed to another. I don't know. I just found that really, like, I don't know. I really enjoy that aspect. I was like, I can't. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of like you can take on different beings. uh, Yeah. How how you're speaking with someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, How about, um, are there any interesting aspects of your topics you were talking about kind of that everyone thinks about the advantages of uh, bilingualism, but, but the disadvantages. Yeah, so like, there's, um, for the disadvantages, most people don't know about it, but it's like, okay, I'm going to make my child learn two languages, um, because it's going to make them look great on their resume, mm-hmm. or, like, they'll just fit into different cultures, or, like, they'll have more of a open, more, um, less narrow worldview yeah. about other cultures and other thoughts, or just, like, just having a tolerance for, like, more things, um, but then there is, like, this cognitive load that is, like, much higher, and their word retrieval is lower um, mm-hmm. as compared to monolinguals who only have to focus on one language as opposed to two. So yeah. they're learning like these two vocabularies at once can be impeding to their own um, um, their own just like brain formation and like how they do things and how they interact with people. So it can be disadvantages um, in that like, um, how do you say this? I don't know. In just that like, it's not, they're not at the same capacity as monolinguals. Mm-hmm. Just yeah, it's kind of, uh, since they're learning to, there's kind of a slowness building up, uh, and mm-hmm. then it reaches some point, say, uh, late elementary school or middle school, where there seems to be no difference, uh, except for having a second language. Yeah. 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 Uh, and how about, uh, have you looked at any difference, so we've been talking about kind of mm-hmm. from birth learning two languages, differences between, like, say, myself, I started learning a second language in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that more difficult for me? Uh, um, from what I know, I didn't put it in my paper especially because I was trying to find like a brain image in which mm-hmm. it was trying to look at like late learners as opposed to oh, early yeah. learners. And I, I, it was difficult to find that because mm-hmm. it's just like the specific studies. Um, so I know that for late learners, there's two different aspects. They're not intertwined as opposed to bilingual people. And I don't know what part of the brain, which is like what I want to get mm-hmm. into in my yeah. question, but it's like... For bilingual people, when they learn it at a um, younger age, these two areas are overlapped as mm-hmm. opposed to being separate, um, as like for late learners. So yeah, where late learners seem to be using, I don't know, more of like a memory or like other cognitive processes mm-hmm. rather than like the language architecture to yeah. learn the language. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, so you made a, a beautiful infographic about uh, bilingualism. Um, we said that there's somewhere between 29 and 900 views on it. <laughs> I uh, got 900. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, have you uh, heard back from anyone that uh, you shared that with? Um, from? The only comment I got was, you forgot to mention Duolingo. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing I got. <laughs> and then seven thumbs up. Seven thumbs up. Yeah. All right. Uh, and so Duolingo for those who don't know about it? Yeah, um, I like Duolingo, but I feel like 
kind of like what we were talking about how like you can have these like brain games Mm -hmm. i feel like duolingo is kind of the same thing where it's like in practice it makes sense but until you're actually practicing with other people you won't get to learn about another language or get that fluency um as opposed to just like having it in like working memory and like just bringing it out whenever you play duolingo as opposed to like actually interacting with someone Mm -hmm. yeah it's like i mean it would have been interesting to like put it but i don't know if it was necessarily relevant yeah, and I think it might be covered when you look at, like, late versus early learners, because mm-hmm. I, I don't think Duolingo is, like, the best way to learn language for an early language yeah, learner, because no. it's just, like, you have to have one language to uh, prop up the second one. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I've played it a little bit uh, just to brush up on my language skills, but uh, I don't know. It takes a, a lot of time, to, in I my think opinion. So, yeah. That's why I, like, I feel like it's, it's a fad in that, like, you're gonna get into it just because everyone's getting into it but mm-hmm. just like I don't know words with friends you're gonna like yeah. pop up like you're just gonna leave it behind mm-hmm. so I don't know it's not very constant yeah uh, and how about um, going forward do you think there's there's any new or interesting areas of research yeah um, actually a new article I don't know about new but it came out in May no not May because May's not here yet oh, yeah. <laughs> but it came out recently where mm-hmm. it's actually looking at the specific areas of the brain that mm-hmm. I want to include in the paper um that are kind of like, I don't know, they have more precision apparently in what like subcortical um, development um, bilingual people have as mm-hmm. compared to monolinguals. So I want to incorporate that. It's just like, you know, just a lot of places. I don't know how to pronounce a lot of these things. Caudate. Uh huh. <laughs> the cumbens. Isn't it like the nucleus, nucleus accumbens? Yeah, yeah. Like they cut it off. So yeah. I knew that. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and thalamus, quote. Pallidus, yeah. Okay. So maybe you know this already. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're um, in, in my field, I wrote, I wrote a paper about uh, the in- interaction between memory and language mm-hmm. and like what uh, aspects of uh, memory do we need to um, use in order to use language. And we talked about, well, you know, there's like vocab, so you need semantic memory to be able to like pull these vocab words. Uh, and then you need. Um, like declarative memory to like flexibly retrieve and put these you know words together in different senses but then we have the rules of language and so mm. that's the like procedural basal ganglia so the caudate nucleus uh or so it involves nucleus that yeah okay. yeah so it's uh, like pulling from these, these different areas okay that sounds really interesting yeah and and then how about uh going forward do you think that there's any really uh, one really important thing that you want to mention uh, or talk about for bilingualism yeah so i guess like going back to the point where like we do know the advantages, but at the same time, when we're pushing, like, I don't know, younger generations to learn, like, two or three languages, mm-hmm. kind of, like, how that might cognitively impair them, as opposed to, like, just learning one and focusing on two languages, or um, just, like, not pushing children to learn, or, like, over-learn and bust their brains mm-hmm. with learning too many languages, yeah. unless it's, like, their passion to learn languages. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All right, so now I, I think looking to wrap up uh, the, the show here, okay. uh, is there anything that you'd like to promote? I'd like to promote Five Five. I don't drink coffee, but it has this um, super caffeine kind of thing. I don't know okay. exactly, but it's just, I don't know. It's a it's a nice um, rush when you drink it, and it has this, it's a cute little bottle too. Okay. And it comes in many flavors. Nice. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, how about, uh, I think we were talking just before we started recording about the ALAS. Oh, ALAS, yeah. ALAS. It's the Alliance of um, Latin American Students, and we're having a Migration Week, um, I believe, two weeks from now. We'll be bringing Fabiana Rodriguez, which she did the Migration is Beautiful um, documentary. We'll be bringing her. And it's actually a TRICO event, so there's going to be um, events happening across the TRICO oh, during okay. this week. Great. Well, I'll look forward to that, uh, and maybe a chance to uh, learn a little bit more about bilingualism with migration. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks uh, so much for taking the time to come in. All right. So thanks to Chantal for joining me uh, for our discussion on bilingualism. Uh, something I'm really interested in, but uh, I think it's more, mostly because I'm a monolingual speaker. Uh, although I started taking Spanish in, what, something like 6th or 7th grade, uh, and took it through 8th, and then 9th, 10th, 11th, 
uh, 12th, had to take a year off because of scheduling uh, for uh, college, uh, but then took an entire year of college Spanish uh, my sophomore year. Uh, I know almost no Spanish now. Uh, I, I think I can say hello or hola. Uh, no hablo uh, espanol. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see uh, what the difference are, differences are between people who can speak uh, more than one language. Uh, let's see, as, as we're wrapping up the show, uh, I think we'll look to Jake's Jams. Uh, Jake's Jams where I talk about things I'm interested in. Uh, something that uh, I've been using uh, and uh, since the death of Google uh, the Google uh, feed uh, I, when I can't even think about it, it's been so long uh, the Google RSS reader uh, I've been using Feedly uh, where I've uh, used a number of RSS feeds from journals uh, of scientific journals that I'm interested in uh, and it gets delivered uh, to my Feedly account uh, every time that uh, journal publishes something uh, so that's been a nice way to stay on top of the literature. Uh, it's a little overwhelming, uh, especially if you follow something like PNAS or Science, Nature, uh, S Journal of Neuroscience, some of those larger uh, journals that will uh, send out hundreds of articles. Uh, it fills up your um, feedly you know, inbox pretty quickly. Uh, but it's been nice to stay on top of uh, different journals and uh, stay on top of science. Uh, then turn into uh, the last part of the show. Uh, we're looking at uh, reader mail or uh, the Twitter mailbox, uh, Twitter tweets. Uh, still nothing so far, uh, but I think I've been releasing these so uh, quickly back to back that there's been no time for people to actually know about uh, how to contact me or uh, think about there actually being a future. Uh, so there's at least mm, ten or, or or twelve more planned episodes that are coming up, uh, and they won't uh, be released until later in April, so uh, plenty of time to contact me at EngageBrain on Twitter or at my uh, last name at gmail.com uh, if you have any questions or any suggestions for a topic that you'd like to learn about in terms of uh, the brain and different ac aspects of cognition. Uh, I'd love to explore them and try to answer them for myself. Uh, so I think that's it for now. Signing off. Uh, this is the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks for listening.